country, the state is going through kind of sudden turnarounds. Who knows how it's going to end up and where we are going to. And probably that uh, needs a discussion. So for our uh, uh, afternoon session, we have the round table that I'm trying to squeeze you into a kind of a circle so we can face easily one another and not just vex of one another. And uh, in, or, you know, in order to stoke up the discussion, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I have, uh, it's, it's very pleasant for, uh, for me that we have two uh, major specialists uh, in unionism and in the Scottish independence autonomy, I would say. Uh, Neil Asherson is uh, a, a major journalist and uh, 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 writer of uh, scripts uh, uh, for films. He wrote uh, a book about, a uh, very famous book about Scotland, uh, its past and the future, Stone Voices, the search for Scotland. He roamed uh, uh, around Europe and also wrote a pretty well-known book, Black Sea, the birthplace of civilization in the And there is a Polish connection, which is important for myself as I'm coming from the country. And he started visiting Poland uh, immediately after the liberalization, or destalinization in the middle of communism in 1957. And he devoted uh, uh, the, some books and uh, some time to uh, the Polish matters. He wrote the, the struggles for Poland. And uh, earlier, he also uh, wrote a book devoted to the, the King Leopold and uh, the Belgian uh, Congo. Turning to Colin, Colin is the leading, uh, actually he's suffering now being the head of uh, our school of history, so everything is on his head, as we say in Polish, about the travels. And Everything's running smooth and nice, so I do appreciate his 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 sight so well. It, it, it shows the the, the uh, tension, but hopefully uh, everything will be going on smoothly. On even though our university is heavy, <laughs> let's not go into it. <coughs> yes. <laughs> Colin is the specialist in the history of unions, meaning in the history of the union of uh, England with Scotland, and he has published uh, about the subject, very well received uh, uh, books uh, recently, Union and Unionist Political Thought in Scotland, uh, 1500 to 2000. And uh, to, uh, in 2006, he published The Forging of Races, Race and Scripture in the Atlantic World. And uh, in 1999, British identities before nationalities, so there is kind of connection with the three modern uh, times. And uh, I can presume that Colin and Neil have a bit different opinions uh, about Scotland and what the future of Scotland uh, should be. Apart from agreeing that it should be prosper prosperous and peaceful, I guess. So I propose that uh, now uh, uh, Neil and Colin will give uh, us uh, their reactions and opinions uh, on the subject uh, in the context of what we've been talking about during our uh, uh, conference. And uh, after that, we'll have the, the discussion. Neil. Well, that's been an extraordinarily interesting morning and early afternoon of discussion about this question of independence, federalism, devolution, and so on uh, in the European context. I, I want to kind of funnel down what I'm saying. It will start with talking about what we've been talking about, my impressions of it, and then sort of get down towards Scotland at the bottom of the funnel and what we may what may happen or what we might do about it. Now 
My own feeling about federation, for example, has always been that uh, as a way of heading off secession, it deserves to fail. Um, federation ought to be an idealistic kind of a thing. It should be a coming together, a will and start, indeed, like Switzerland, of people who wish to associate for whatever reason. What it should not be is an emergency measure to try and block some historical process which is rolling uh, towards its end. Now, uh, none of these processes, not all of them at least, are in inevitable. Uh, we've been hearing about Belgium. Belgium is quite a good example of the other, which is that uh, you know here, in a sense, the process, uh, the situation of, of a federal constitution was rather developed to hinder a secession. Um, although it's been pointed out that actually, when it came to it, that secession probably would never have happened because the Belgians, different, you know, Walloons and Flemings don't really want to stand alone as independent states. Nevertheless, it had that positive aspect to it. Now, I've learned a lot of things today, it seems to me by listening to you all. One of them is that, uh, of course, there are parts of Europe is, is, uh, in particular where the devolution of power, the distribution of power uh, to territorial subunits within a state is seen as a threat. Uh, this is a consequence of the dire history, largely, of Eastern Europe, and that includes Poland, of course, and of um, the post-Soviet states. It is seen as something forced on a fragile independence in order to diminish it or indeed to cripple it. This is the way that uh, many franchises and um, federations or federal attempts of this kind have been perceived. Um, you only have to look at Georgia, for example, um, which was only able to perceive the perfectly justified wishes of Abkhazia to be completely autonomous with an association with the Georgian state but not part of it, uh, they could only understand this as uh, a deliberate plot, probably by Russia, in order to destroy the reality of Georgian independence or undermine it. Um, and I could think of many other examples of the same kind. Now that's one thing to bear in mind. Another, it seemed, which came out of today, is that there must be some degree of subsidiarity underlying a successful federation. There must be this coming together and there must be this consent. And that has to be based on some feeling that there are units at the base of a political society which have entrenched rights and that power begins at the bottom and moves upwards. This is not the British situation or tradition, but we'll come to that. I've learned, I think, that, I'm not sure about this at all, but I can't think of contrary examples, that, um, as Anna said, that a federation which is whose divisions are, draw, are not drawn along the lines of ethnic divisions, sooner or later is heading into trouble, possibly bloodshed. And of course, obviously, Yugoslavia demonstrated that in its catastrophic end. And you could also say that the partition of Ireland, 1922, led to the same consequences. Uh, this was an in, uh, you know, a convenient division, as it were, eventually accepted uh, by uh, Northern Ireland and the British government. But, of course, it left uh, unsolved the presence of very large, profoundly dissenting minorities of different religion within this new Northern Ireland sub-state. And at the end of that was the trouble, um, whose difficulties in maintaining uh, sensible policies still 
reverberate and continue to this day. I think that that, of course, does not apply to Scotland because Scotland, uh, you could say smugly, doesn't have ethnic divisions. Uh, Scotland has no Ulster. Um, yes, it has no Ulster. And uh, it doesn't have uh, ethnic divisions of a long-standing kind. And as some of you will know, uh, Scotland is a very curious mongrel community as a political state. And it always has been, and this has always been accepted. There have occasionally been efforts to speak of a united Scottish people as a sort of ethnicity. But the absurdity of that means that they haven't lasted very long. Because there was, put it like this, there was a kingdom of Scotland for a long time in the Middle Ages before anybody spoke of a Scottish people. And this is because it represented the coming together of Gaelic-speaking Scots from the Dalriada Kingdom in the west, uh, Norse-speaking invaders from the north, settlers indeed, they weren't just invaders, uh, Anglians coming from the south, and the Picts in the northeast, and the British of Strathclyde, another Celtic group, who eventually merged with the Welsh, perhaps. So the idea, you know, one of the greatest cheers I heard in uh, one of the big, uh, very early nationalist rallies in 1992, at the time of the Edinburgh summit of the European community, as it then was, was um, when the novelist McIlvany, William McIlvany, said, uh, we are a mongrel tradition, and this enormous crowd just burst into a wild applause. I can't think of any other nation where this could possibly have happened. So uh, that is not to say that Scotland is free of racial prejudice. It isn't. Dirty, horrible things happened uh, and still happen from time to time. Um, relations between the Scottish settled communities and incomers, you know, the Asian communities and so on, have been really pretty good. But, you know, they are very far from perfect. And it could, of course, be said that the enduring sectarian clashes and prejudices, in the, particularly in the west of Scotland, are actually a form of racism. You could argue that. But by and large, this is not a problem which, which affects the future of Scotland as a polity. Now, the next thing that I learned was that um, federal competencies, if a federation is to work, federal competencies must be clear. You must know who is supposed to do what. Not only that, but once you've decided that, you have to bloody well stick with it. I mean, we've just had completely, well, it's not, we don't live in a federation, we live in a devolved uh, uh, state, you see, in, in the UK. We just had a ridiculous occasion in which um, there was this a sort of fisheries summit on deep sea quote, fish quotas in Brussels. This was at the end of last year, in which 95% uh, of the boats concerned with these deep sea, particular deep sea fisheries, are Scottish and come from Scotland. There is a Scottish fisheries minister called Richard Lockhead, and um, what happened was <laughs> he went to Brussels. And the British government said, you can't lead the delegation, you're just a Scottish minister. He said, but this is about a Scottish interest. The English dimension of this is, is infinitesimal, terribly small. No, no, you're not allowed to. And instead, the person sent to lead the delegation about this was, uh, he's called Lord R Rupert Ponsonby de Morley. And he was, uh, is a hereditary Tory Peer, who really knows nothing about fisheries. And indeed, um, Richard Lockhead had to brief him before he went into the conference chamber. But that is a, in actually a violation of a series of agreements about representation of the EU, which have uh, been going on in the course of the last couple of years. So, I mean, I come back to it. Competencies have to be quite clear, and you have to stick to them and honour them. 
Now, yes, last and perhaps most important conclusion about all this is that something much more serious than Lord Rupert is that a federation really must be based on a division of sovereignty which is entrenched by a constitution. I don't see how else a federation can possibly work. And this has been one of the problems dogging all the constitutional arguments about the future and indeed the past of the United Kingdom. Right, because when we now come, and the next thing I want to talk about briefly is the United Kingdom and federation. Now, here we come to something I think that Colin and I do, don't agree about this, really, which is I think that uh, Britain's adherence to the principle of parliamentary sovereignty is crippling and serious. And I think, Colin, that you feel that this is not really to be taken seriously. It doesn't matter so much. Anyway, we we'll come to that. You all come to that in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is extremely serious. I think it influences all kinds of British attitudes. Now, what does it mean? Uh, it's part of what you could call English, English exceptionalism. Um, England is a wonderful country with an extraordinary pioneering history in Europe and indeed in the world in many ways. However, it has paid the penalty of being first, which with many things, one of which is modern revolution. Uh, there was a revolution, as you know, in the 1640s in England, and then uh, a sort of restoration eventually of uh, absolute monarchy, followed by another, well, rather polite revolution, which in fact was an invasion by um, a Dutch monarch with an army who then conquered and occupied England and eventually Scotland as well. Now, what happened was this. 1688, the so-called Glorious Revolution, uh, took the principle of absolute monarchy, divine right, absolute monarchy, and instead of demolishing it completely, it simply transferred it to an elected parliament so that absolutism still exists and it is the absolute right of the British Parliament of Westminster to do exactly what it is like. It has no concept or understanding of the idea of supreme law. That is quite alien to British or, if you like, Anglo-British constitutional thinking. And it is very difficult to talk about federation if you have an attitude like that. I mean, let me give you a brief example. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher, well, how can I put it? If you take a country like Germany, there uh, the existence and the rights of the individual, obviously, states, members of the Federation, or if you like, city-states like Hamburg, are entrenched. They're part of a constitution. If you were to violate them, you would end up in prison. Mrs. Thatcher took a dislike to what were then called metropolitan authorities because they were dominated by the Labour Party. So she decided to abolish them. She uh, was able by a small majority vote one day in the House of Commons, that was all it took, supremacy of parliament, parliamentary sovereignty, to abolish the existence of London's self-government, a, a, a polity with the population of Hungary uh, and overnight, in stroke of the pen, she abolished the elected democratic government of the city of London, Manchester as well, and so on. Um, she replaced it with something else eventually. The point I'm making is that any enlightenment European country, she would have ended up in prison for doing that. This is a constitutional crime. Britain doesn't have a constitution, instead it has this doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, which the parliament has absolute power to do anything it likes. Now, having said all that, the Anglo-British constitution is 
Mm. Well, it is built, it is deeply, deeply authoritarian and archaic in structure, but it has been managed by a society uh, which is soused in liberal, reasonable tradition and approaches. And it has been, although it is, as it were, designed to be operated by a Tsar, the fact is it has been operated by deeply reasonable, kindly people, by and large, usually aristocrats, whose idea has been, don't carry things to extreme, be a bit reasonable, I mean, let's not do it all, let's you know, hold back a wee bit or allow for something. And so in this way, Britain, Anglo-Britain, whatever you like to call it, Eukania, has been a livable in society, no thanks to its constitutional arrangements. Now, where this then becomes difficult is uh, if you try to distribute power, because there isn't any way that you can, technically, uh, because otherwise you would say that Parliament is not absolute. Uh, the reality is that parliamentary absolutism <laughs> has been gradually penetrated like an old tweed blanket, you know, rotting away in a cupboard. It's got full of moth holes. And some of these quite interesting. One is judicial review, in which a court can now challenge certain kinds of governmental decisions and say, you know, the pre precedent of what you're supposed to do in the Department of Agriculture suggests that you were going beyond your powers in saying that man couldn't uh, put that sort of fertilizer on his field. So reverse that decision. But that sort of thing begins. Uh, but, and here and there, of course, and then membership of the EU creates an extraordinary contradiction because the EU is an authority. It says, uh, it legislates, and Britain is required to um, accept this legislation and incorporate it into its own. However, this is obviously overruling the sacred principle of parliamentary sovereignty. And this, the resentment at that is at the root of a great many things which are going on at the moment. We'll come to that. Now, I want to look, go back to this question of federalism and how it has been attempted, affected, regarded uh, in the Anglo-British state. Uh, federalism was first thought of in exactly the way that I mentioned right at the start of what I've been saying. Uh, it was in connection, of course, to the Irish question. And it was thought up, it was invoked federalism as a way of stopping Ireland becoming independent. Uh, it was indeed invoked at a time when Ireland was rather passive and was thinking only in terms of perhaps a little bit of autonomy. Uh, and it came up, a man called Isaac Butt, who was the leader, the first leader of the old Home Rule Party, uh, which wanted really just um, to restore some kind of elected government to Ireland, uh, or a sub-government within the United Kingdom. He didn't want independence actually a Tory in many of his opinions. And in the 1870s, he brought up the idea that the United Kingdom should be restructured into three units, England, Ireland, Scotland. Each of the three units should be self-governing, and their rights to self-govern themselves in internal matters should be entrenched, and there should be a fourth unit, an imperial government, which dealt with all the other things like uh, the military, defense, and so on, which, uh, and foreign affairs, which these three sub-governments couldn't tackle. Well, nothing came of that, and the idea fell away. It was almost forgotten. It then revived as the question of home rule really returned to the front of the British agenda with renewed crises over Ireland in the years just before the First World War and during the First World War. As you know, uh, the various tensions came to a head in 1916 with the Easter Rising in Dublin and uh, the subsequent execution of all its leaders by the British uh, helped, didn't actually cause 
the enormous mobilization and radicalization of Irish opinion, but it sure accelerated it. Anyway, at that point, um, British started to think seriously, how can we head off what is now an accelerating uh, gathering movement for full secession by Ireland? How can we stop the Irish leaving? And so the question of federalism came up. And for the first and I think the last time, really, federalism suddenly became fashionable. Everybody, all the kind of clever London papers, uh, talked about it and wrote articles and leaders about it. People made speeches about it, Parliament, the Lords, everywhere else. And uh, it was elaborately discussed, um, actually to no purpose, particularly in the years after 1916, between 1916 and 1918. Uh, in 1918, uh, the whole Irish situation finally went completely out of control from the British point of view because uh, the British insanely decided to introduce conscription for the First World War into Ireland. Uh, at that point, Ireland became uncontrollable and uh, uh, in the I think it was December 1918 elections, uh, a majority of Irish MPs was returned who were I think almost to a man uh, in favour of total independence. They were all Sinn Féin party members, almost all of them. Anyway, what's interesting about all that is uh, how it was looked at at the time. People thought, well, federalism for the UK, uh, it must be accompanied by you see, home rule all round, you see, in which uh, Scotland would have its parliament and its self-government, and England too. And Wales, well, a door was left open for Wales. And then, so you had these three, the same thing as Isaac Butts, really, the same kind of structure of uh, three subunits and one supreme Westminster over parliament. The question of sovereignty was never really worked out in these arguments. The sort of things which did come up were arguments about a customs union. Uh, those who were in favour of federation said, this British federation must be a customs union. That means that we cannot possibly uh, allow the subunits, Ireland or Scotland, or indeed England, to have fiscal autonomy to set their own taxes, which is being much argued about for Scotland at the moment, as you may know. They said that would be uh, absolutely, it would mean that you didn't have, it wasn't a federation, it would mean a confederation if you didn't have a full customs union but left customs and fiscal setting of taxes to the individual units. And they said that would reduce Ireland, for example, to the status of a dominion. It would be an independent country just in association with the Anglo-British state, which remained. Anyway, that all fell apart, and Ireland, as you know, became independent, effectively. The Irish Free State emerged, 1922. And um, if you look on those efforts, you can see ahead things which are now very relevant, um, problems which they really did not address. One of them was, of course, that they ignored the extraordinary asymmetry of the United Kingdom in terms of population. They did not say, how are we going to fit England, which has, leaving out Ireland for the moment, by the way, but le less Ireland, England composes 85% of the UK's population. That is one unit. So <laughs> what about the rest, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, you know? I mean, how could you possibly construct a federation which is as asymmetrical as that. Well, there is, of course, an answer to this, which is bust up England, smash it up into regions, self-governing regions, each of them, you know, maybe the size of Scotland, five million each, whatever it may be, and like that, uh, it could work. Now, the difficulty about that is that the evidence so far is that English people do not want that. They have twice now in my time uh, attempted to 
um, sell regional, powerful regional self-government to the northeast of England, which is probably the most clearly defined region in England. Both times it has been firmly turned down. People do not want it. That doesn't mean that people all over England love Westminster government. They often hate it, but they like to have the right to grumble. But the idea of busting up England into self-governing regions, at that point, people draw back. I'm not sure about this, but I think it's almost true to say that England has a perfectly respectable ancient tradition of central government. And uh, this is a tradition which has often been appealed to, most recently perhaps by the Labour government in 1945, who said, and after it, who said, if you want basic social reform and progress in this country, it can only be done by the centre. Only we have the power to override all the contrary interests and local interests, which are an obstacle to a welfare state, a universal welfare state, you know, national health service, all the rest of it, you know, nationalisation of the railways. It has to be done from the centre. And uh, this, you could say, has a very respectable ancestry in English, the history of English governance and the relation of the English to um, kings in the past. Of course there have been rebellions, a very few of them really locally based, um, some confessional rather than regional things like the Pilgrimage of Grace, which was about religion in the 1570s when it However, so, you know, that doesn't seem to, this is something which all these discussions about federalism preferred not to look at. How do you fit England into a British federation? Now, um, this is why, one of the reasons why federation, it seems to me, will not work in the United Kingdom. Uh, Enoch Powell, the old Tory politician of the far right, who was a very shrewd analyst of, uh, of uh, how the British state worked, always used to say, power devolved is power retained. And what he meant by that was what I've been saying, which is that you can, as we now have, devolve power to you know, the central power has devolved government to sub-governments in Wales and in Scotland, but it could, in theory, at any time, withdraw all that and cancel it out as Margaret Thatcher cancelled the government of London all those years ago. I don't think it ever would. The power, however, is there, and there is no constitutional entrenchment of devolution. It isn't really possible in the British system because the idea which has been, I don't think one should exaggerate this, but Colin, you know, you know more about this than I do. I mean, Scots like to say, well, of course, we have a European constitutional tradition which uh, is about consensual, contractual government and written constitutions and the law. And there is sort of something in that. Not a lot, but there is something. I mean, it was a Scot who wrote a book called Lex Rex, you know, and that is about the idea of supreme law. Um, as I say, this is a concept which is completely incomprehensible to your average English parliamentarian. The idea that there could be a court, a supreme court, adjudging the constitution, which is above parliament, and which could strike down the decisions of an elected parliament. And until you can understand and internalize that, I don't see how you can approach a federation. Um, and it seems to me that the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, it still powers so many political instincts. Uh, you know, Europhobia arises largely from that in England uh, and in the Westminster apparatus. Hostility to the European Court of Human Rights this fuss which is going on, so many things which are contained in the latest Queen's speech by David Cameron have a relation not just to 
insularity or xenophobia or something like that, but something much more serious, which is a feeling that England ought to be independent. We cannot let ourselves be indefinitely overruled by foreigners. No. So if, you, if you really take your stand on that, you're also saying that you can't, if, if you can't devolve authority or let out authority to somebody outside, neither can you really effectively do it internally either. Now, as I've said, um, we have, in talking about federation as a future for the United Kingdom now, uh, we have these English problem, the problem of England as such in size, and you know the perfectly respectable willi unwillingness of English people to be regionalised. Those have to be somehow overcome if there's to be a federation, and I do not see that they can be overcome. We have at the moment the British government has proposed and will carry through. A program of uh, what's called um, it's devolution to cities, so that the great cities of Northern England, this so-called Northern powerhouse concept, will give massive power back because they did once have it to so many cities, particularly English cities. Um, is this an answer to the problem of regionalising England? No, it is not, because it has nothing to say about the territorial dimension of England and how that can be fitted into a federation. They're not even city-states. So, it seems to me then that we are looking at the only way ahead is towards a confederation of independent nations, a very amicable and very intimate one which would involve Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland and very possibly in the course of time the Republic of Ireland as well into a kind of amicable unit closely cooperating and founded on affection and understood rules. Uh, of course, we, having said all that, will Scotland actually advance towards independence and will it get there? Well, we don't know that, but it seems to me that the answer is probably yes. Uh, in 2014, time of the independence referendum, one way of looking at what happened then was that although, of course, independence was defeated by a very clear majority, 10%, at the same time, the campaign with its extraordinary mobilization, unprecedented, really, of the electorate, and people who never voted or bothered about politics or registered came out and took part in all these arguments all over Scotland. What happened was that independence became promoted from a slightly crazy outside idea to an absolutely sensible, practical, alternative option for the future of Scotland. You might not like it, you could choose the other one to stay in the Union, improvements to devolution, or you could choose to go independent. But independence is now a serious option. Secondly, what happened this year in the general election, and which as you know, the Scottish National Party uh, took 56 out of the 59 Scottish seats uh, the Labour Party lost 40 out of its 41 seats. Um, there are a lot to be said about that, but one thing to be said about it is that it represents an abandonment, a turning away from the Westminster political system of a historic kind. Uh, <coughs> I hope that Scotland will not remain a one-party state, but I don't think it will. That's right, with the Hollywood elections next year, internal Scottish elections, will, because they're on proportional representation, will restore a healthy opposition. At least I done well hope so. But these two things, independence is now a clear option. A huge 
very unexpected popular movement which says uh, we do not wish any longer to be represented by parties which are just branch offices of parties located and based in the south in London, but we want our own. This is what it wants. This, if it was about anything, that is what it was saying. So given those two changes in the course of the less than a year, it looks to me as if this movement is going to continue and roll on. It will not roll without checks and it will roll into some strange places because one thing all Scottish politicians agree, talking to them during the election campaign, especially the SNP, is we do not know why people are doing this or what they are going to do next. It's out of our hands. And to hear politicians say that about the people is a moving experience and an exciting one. Yes, uncertainty, but it is the sort of uncertainty I personally relish. So I think that Scotland, the constitutional problem uh, which is posed by this Scottish movement essentially can only be solved by uh, Scottish independence, independence within Europe, independence within a confederation including England, the rest of the UK, however you like to put it, but federal solutions are not on, particularly at all federal, federal solutions now being advanced, violate the rule which I first said, which they are simply panic measures brought forward, fought up to head off uh, a Scottish secession. Thank you. Another voice in this duologue before it uh, yeah. uh, becomes a discussion. Yeah. Um, well, I think I, I think I ought to start with a with a, with a preamble to um, explain where I come from and how I'm situated uh, relative to Neil because it's it, 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 it's it, it's not at all straightforward. I ought to come out, as it were, as what I think now think of as a British Ottoman. <laughs> uh, it, it, in, in, in that I do, I do favour a kind of multi-millet style, uh, asymmetrical indeed, um, United United Kingdom. But I, 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 I do ultimately believe that it's in Scotland's best interest um, to be coherent, uh, to, to be belong to a coherent United um, Kingdom. Uh, and um, I should say that. Neil and I are opponents uh, in this, um, and we and what's the Scot what's called the Scottish Unionist. And Scots being a Scottish Unionist is one of the um, the most unfortunate things uh, to be in modern Scotland. We are, of course, a, ma a majority uh, in Scotland, but we're a majority that's really not allowed to articulate what it um, oh. what well what what it got the whole press. Mm. Part one. See? Even, 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 even now, even now, I'm not entirely allowed to articulate. We have, but Neil is, Neil is an opponent. Um, but our, our opponents we can deal with. The problem we have is our friends. And it's our friends south of the border who notionally uh, support us, but, well, to be honest, they, uh, they, they, they don't understand Scotland, and so everything they do actually makes things worse. So we, I think we could handle Neil and his, and his, and his friend, I, I, as a majority, the majority that dare not speak its name, but there are other problems, whether it be Margaret Thatcher, the unionist, and, or David Cameron, the unionist. We, we've, 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 had, we've had problems. Anyway, I'd also like to make an apology uh, that I arrived late today because I was at the heart of the union, in, at the heart of Britishness, which is Northern Ireland. I was in Northern Ireland uh, yesterday. And um, Northern Ireland is the only place one goes in the UK where one uh, finds uh, Union Jacks flying pretty much all the time or finds curbsides painted yeah. in, the, in the Union Jack. And this is uh, an oddity because it just shows that the people of Northern Ireland who think they are British 
are not in the least British because to dis display one's Britishness with this sort of ostentatious waving of the Union Jack is to be un-Britishly -Brit un British, um, as it were. It's just, it's just, it's just not on. So we've got a, got a problem here is that the most British part of the United Kingdom is not, in fact, in, on the island of Great Britain. Uh, there's also a further problem, which is that the most aggressively British of those un-British Britons in Northern Ireland are Scots. Uh, and they also, but we'll come to the language question in a minute, but <coughs> they're now linked to the Ulster Scots movement, where the, these are people who, who speak um, a kind of Scots patois, or, or, or claim to, and get massive grants, actually, a lot of money in this, in, in this business. But it's, it's the Scots language is being used to articulate a, a particular kind of loyalty to the United Kingdom state. My shorthand here is that I'm, I, I'm suggesting that things are more complicated than they seem at uh, first sight. And I should also say that Ireland is unlike Scotland, and the there is a divide in Scotland at the moment. There's, there's no doubt about that, but it's not, a, it's not a clear one. It's not a clear one based on religious divisions, nor nor on, on, on housing patterns. In, in, in Northern Ireland, the communities are, are t tend, to be, tend to be segregated. Now, what kind of nationalism do we have here in, in, in Scotland? Well, I think we can be reassured that what, that what we have is almost exclusively civic. Uh, and certainly, I mean, it, it's... I, I, I'm not a particular friend of the SNP, um, but I have, to, I have to hand it to them. They are not ethnic nationalists, and they've, they've gone out of their way to make that clear. And Neil talked about Scots Asians for independence and so forth. Oh. Uh, yes. Whether, whether it's entirely true of all, all those who are as well, camp followers, well, I'll, I'll leave that for the moment. But it's also an odd kind of civic nationalism because... Um, it's a civic nationalism that harks back, back further than the Battle of Kosovo, uh, in fact, back to the, the late 13th and early 14th century, please the early 14th century, to a, a, a battle in the summer of 1314 and uh, a document sent to uh, uh, the Pope in, um, in uh, 1320. So it's a civic nationalism that proclaims its, its non-ethnocentric status, but still harks back to a 14th century uh, conflict uh, with England. It's also an odd kind of civic uh, nationalism because it doesn't actually focus very much on institutions. There's very little discussion of um, an indigenous Scottish parliamentary uh, tradition. I mean, there was a Scottish parliament up until 1707. But it, not much discussed. There is some um, the invocation of a of a distinctive Scots legal tradition. That, that's true. But it's I have to say it's a pretty pretty recherchy thing. That it, it's not it's not something I ever uh, noticed very much of in the pubs of Glasgow uh, when, when I was there. People talking about our Scots Romanist come Romano canonical legal uh, tr tradition. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't much discussed, even, even, even on the Byers Road, in fact, in, in, in Glasgow. Oh, right. Yeah, even on the Byers Road. Uh, there's also an ecclesiastical dimension uh, within the, the Union. The Scot Scotland has its own established church, which is different from the established church in England. It's a Presbyterian church, which has its own constitutional uh, traditions. But I have to say, Scottish nationalism is now very much multi-faith. And I suspect, actually, I mean, my impression as a kind of external buttress of the ch established Church of Scotland uh, is that many of the ministers of the Kirk favoured independence, but the pensioners, and there are largely pensioners on the pews, 
were the core of the no vote. And I think, and I think there were no voters who weren't sort of swayed by any last minute vows. They were, they were no to the core. Now, since Tom X here, I have to say something about, 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 about language, I think. Language is not an issue, uh, directly at least, in this uh, national uh, movement. Uh, in Scotland, I guess we have, we have a, very, a very small indigenous um, language community, uh, the Gaelic speaking community, which is roughly, according to the latest census, but 57,000 speakers, 1.1% of the Scottish population. It's not significant, though uh, at the moment every, every railway station is sort of, even, even, even places like Troon now have you know, Gallic, Gallic toponyms, Gallic place names uh, there. So the, um, the SNP plays with the Gallic issue, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not a major issue. We also have um, Scots, the language of Scots, uh, which is a, an oral speech. There, there, there is a, a literature, quite some of it brilliant, particularly in poetry, but it's largely, um, a, uh, again, this, this, this is a very uh, troublesome area in which to use terminology. It, it, it is effectively, uh, and has been since the Reformation, dialect, not least since um, the major translations of the Bible used in Scotland uh, were in English rather than uh, Scots, and certainly since the Reformation, all, all printed sermons uh, have been in English, though they may sometimes <coughs> be delivered in Scots as, Scots, uh, as an oral tongue. Well, as I said earlier, Ulster Scots uh, is also as much a unionist, very much a unionist language rather than uh, a nationalist uh, one. We also have the, the history behind the languages. Gaelic, um, the this ancient indigenous language of Scotland, was traditionally, uh, for many centuries, known as Erse, meaning Irish. In other words, the indigenous Scots regarded it as an alien imposition. And Scots, the, um, the form of the dialect of English, if you like, that Scots habitually speak, was originally, from the late medieval period, known as English. In other words, it was known as English. So um, these two main uh, languages in Scotland that, are, that one differentiates from English, the Celtic language, Gaelic, was known as Irish, and the Scots variant English was known as English. English. So again, not straightforward. And if there's any, if there's any uh, message coming out of all of this, it's that identities are fluid and change quite significantly over time. There's also a further big problem, which is that Scotland is both itself and very English. In fact, I think Scotland is a lot more like England than many Scots imagine. But with some differences too. In other words, I'm, I'm arguing both sides of the question here. I'm riding two horses simultaneously. And what E.P. Thompson called the peculiarities of the English, well, many of those, you know, and Neil has actually indirectly invoked Ian Thompson here, this avoidance of a modern style of revolution. And so and, and, and that all our problems stem from having a, a, a pre-modern revolution in 1688. It's very much E.P. Thompson uh, like here. And Thompson called this the peculiar thing with that why why does England not have an enlightenment? Why does England not have a, a proper a proper modern style revolution and so forth? He calls the, the this issue the peculiarities of the English well the Scots to, to partake of the peculiarities of the English, they share many of these same features, this unrevolutionary pragmatism and so forth. But they're both part of English history and 
something else simultaneously. The Scots are both English and slightly different than themselves too. But still, I think, on the whole, the dominant feature in, for much of modern Scottish history, has in fact been um, a kind of assimilation uh, to England, uh, in fact. But not without countercurrents and counter uh, tendencies. And uh, I should mention here that I should invoke uh, one of my favourite figures in uh, the debate on the Union. The figure I think of as the first John Major, who was uh, John Mayer of Haddington in East Lothian in the early 16th century. And, and my, my colleague Ron, Ron, Roger Mason had he's invoked John Mayer of Haddington as the, the coiner of the East Lothian question. Uh, the East Lothian question of the 60s, and, 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 and <coughs> by the way, Mayer is someone who he, 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 a great intellectual, but a late scholastic figure, went to the University of Paris, wrote in Latin, and he Latinized his name Mayer as Mylor. And so he wrote this history of Greater Britain in the 1520s, which if you think about the Latin is uh, Historia Maioris Britannia. Britanniae Johannes Maioris, a great, a great Latin um, pun. But this is a, a century before the first union, the Union of the Crowns of 1603. And Mayer was saying, we Scots need a union with England. And we've got all our issues here today, economy, independence, federalism, centralization. And I'd like to throw in another uh, two uh, there, two themes here, two categories, because Mayer said union, that's another category, union is essential if we Scots are to avoid being part of an English empire. And its empire is the opposite of union. In, in Scottish political debate, the assumption tends to be made that the opposite of unionism is nationalism. It is now, but for much of modern, early modern and modern Scotland's history, the opposite of unionism was imperialism, was English imperialism. Being, as Neil says, a, a small rump of an English dominated island, mayor and subsequent generations of Scots Unionists came to the conclusion that the only way for Scotland to be Scotland on this island, in other words, being in bed with this elephant that might roll over, was to have some kind of union agreement with England about uh, Scotland's status. And as late as the 19th century, according to the, soci the historical sociologist Lindsay Patterson, in his wonderful book, uh, The Autonomy of Modern Scotland, Scots in the 19th century went out of their way to raise funds for people like Kossuth and Garibaldi and so forth to help these oppressed nationalities in Europe realize what the Scots enjoyed within Union which was national autonomy. And so it, at the Wallace Monument uh, in, uh, outside Stirling, which was put up in the mid 19th century, there was a, there was a little um, display of um, artifacts from the various other national movements in Europe who were thanked <coughs> for their support for this. But the monument that went up was a monument to the Union that Wallace, who was one of these, uh, he was a late. 13th century leader of the Scottish War of Independence against, Wallace was celebrated for much of the 19th century as someone who paved the way to a proper union of equals between Scotland and England. That's what the War of National Liberation was about. It was about attaining a future union of equals, not about um, independence. I should also mention um, 
another issue that I've raised in ethnicity, because another theme, in the 19th century, things were totally different from the way they would be in the 20th. Race and ethnicity raised their head in, in, in the 19th century, but in a most odd way. And we had many Scots ethnologists and anthropologists going around measuring the skulls of local populations to find out whether they were fat-headed brachycephalic peoples or long, long-headed dolichocephalic peoples and this kind of thing. But in the course of their investigations, they came to the conclusion, this was, this was a kind of consensus position in Scottish anthropology, that the lowland Scots, particularly those in Lod the Lothians and Angus, and this was part of the the east coast of, of Scotland, uh, were the most Anglian, i.e. the most English, people <coughs> in the whole of the British Isles. In other words, the most English people were not found in England, they were found in Scotland. Of course, there was a minority here, which was the Gallic minority, and 19th century Lowland Scots dished it out two groups. The group that came from Ireland that fled from the Irish famine in the 1840s, they regarded them as an inferior uh, sub-race, as they did the, the Celtic-speaking, the Gaelic-speaking Scots from the highlands of Scotland, who were a minority not only in the UK, but also, in effect, a despised minority within Scotland. The real cleavage here was not between England and Scotland, it was between lowland Scots who regarded themselves as English, not just as English as the English, but possibly more English than the English, and this Celtic minority that we, that we remember was regarded as quasi-Irish. And I think one of the dominant uh, languages in which all of this has been discussed in the uh, the British tradition is what we might call Whigism, after uh, Sir Herbert Butterfield. It's a language that includes a bit of a bit of liberalism. It's certainly uh, centralising. As I, I, this, uh, yeah, I'm a bit confused. I'm, I'm unaccustomed to agreeing with Neil, but Neil was spot on when he said that it, the English like centralisation. This is this is the late Sir Geoffrey Elton's point: is the English like two things. They like the smack of firm government, which they've had since about the 10th century. And they like liberty too. And the two were connected. You could only have, you enjoy the liberties of an Englishman, I think it was Englishman, uh, with the smack of firm, authoritarian, central government and royal courts. You want royal courts, the king's courts, none of your baronial courtly nonsense. And this was a basis of consensus, and Parliament grew out of, uh, as it were, the king's, the king's, um, the king's court. I guess we're on here to the subject of the Constitution. I haven't meant to talk about, but uh, provoked me so. You know, so <laughs> I, I, I thought I might as well respond. I, 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 again, I'm going to make a make a confession. Yes, I, I, I am a kind of wasn't the last Dicey poster boy, uh, as, it, as, it, as it were. In fact, I, I, I'm strongly attached to parliamentary sovereignty. Um, but it's, it's partly because I, I've got nothing against judges per se. I like them as individuals. I like them so much that I don't want them to have the burden of making political decisions. And I think back to the uh, United States election of, of 2000, when, in effect, um, an election contested by one of those 200 odd million people was essentially decided by two people. It was decided by Anthony Kennedy and Sandra Hugh Connor, who were the two swing justices out of the nine on the US Supreme Court. And so um, I. I don't like written constitutions, and I do like parliamentary sovereignty, because parliamentary sovereignty gives us a bit of clarity, and it 
gives us clear uh, decision making based on the democratic mandate of the people, particularly when you have a system like the United Kingdom's. Uh, well, we do have constitutions, it's not all written down in the one place, it's just not, co it's a non codified, but it is written in many places, um, where we have two of the pillars do nothing. We've got a triadic system where two of the pillars are like Atlas candidates and don't, don't actually support anything. The monarchy does nothing and is effectively forbidden from doing anything by, by, by convention. And the House of Lords pretty much does nothing. And so we have, we have in the bicameral UK constitution, we have a unicameral uh, system in which, in which every, all power it is sent to the board, uh, the House of Commons, which means our elections do have value. And outside of this, I have to say, is though that uh, the multinational nature of the United Kingdom is just 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 plays no part to this. It's just un unrecognised. But this has only been an issue recently, if we exclude that from 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 this. But with, if, if one thinks about this idol. It's only been an issue here in very recent times because, as late as the, the late 1960s, the, the standard textbook for British elections, written by my a good friend Peter Brolter, uh, who um, has this wonderful, wonderful line that in British politics, class, class is everything. And it was true at the time, it was true at the time of 1967, the first edition, but even true in some of the later editions, well, if class is everything, all else, meaning things like nationalism, even, even liberalism, whatnot, all else is mere embellishment and detail. It's a bit of a fun of the fair, but it's all a sideline to class. Because on both sides of the border, people voted along class lines, including Scots, and, and, and the, the voting patterns on both sides of the border were remarkably, remarkably uh, similar. And many Scots, lawyers, theorists, constitutional writers, accepted and still accept the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty. Only changed the first time we could see any Scot really um, questioning this is in the 1950s uh, with Lord, Lord Cooper in, in the case of McCormick versus Lord Abbott in 1953. And Lord Cooper even Lord Cooper in some of his earlier decisions was a was a nice kid. And he, he converted very, very late in the day. In fact, somebody once told me that they, they thought he only converted when the Queen came to the Crown in Scotland and carried it. Was it you that told me about that? The Queen came to our coronation carrying a handbag and, and didn't dr dress up for the Scottish coronation. And that Lord, Lord Cooper took such a huff <laughs> at this that he abandoned the, the dicey interpretation. Uh, right, and so in terms of our, in terms of where we stand, I just want to, to finish up by saying something about the nature of the state to which we belong. Uh, because I, when I started research in this area in the late 1980s, 1987 or thereabouts, I actually used Lord Scots laws away into this. And I, I, from him, I learned the orthodox <coughs> that the United Kingdom was a mixed unitary state. In other words, it was unitary in the sense that it had a single monarch, single executive power, a single legislative body, but it had these things like you know, two established churches, it had a separate legal system in Scotland. It was actually a unitary state with a few frills. It was mixed unitary. Then, I learned, well actually that wasn't quite the case, that what we lived in was a union state which was different from a unitary state and that Margaret Thatcher mistakenly assumed we lived in a unitary state but in fact we lived in a union state where there was a permissible um, element of uh, divergence of lack, of lack of symmetry, lack of uniformity, some you know, ad hoc arrangements or special arrangements uh, and I guess um, uh, Derek Martin <coughs> or when signed Rockham, the, the, the region uh, political science was central in, um, as it were, bringing union state terminology into the place. And then more recently, uh, James Mitchell, another, another good friend who I, I assume takes a different light. He said, well, 
no, actually, we don't live in a union state. What we live in is a, in a state of unions. Because we England united with Wales in two acts in the 1530s and 1540s, so 1536, 1543. It then sort of united under the common crown with Scotland in 1603, was formally united with Scotland in 1707. That state was then formally united with Ireland in 1800, 1801. But, um, the Irish Free State broke away from that in 1921, effectively. And it, it, since 1921, there was a, a, a Northern Ireland state with its own, uh, its own union-like relationship with, with the British state. So we live in a state of unions. But, so, um, I don't even know. I, I, I guess one of, one of my messages here is that even in the... Um, in the very short period that I've been studying these things, so for about 1987, when I started my, my doctoral work to now, um, we've got four different sort of terminologies to describe the, um, the United uh, Kingdom uh, Constitution. And I should, I should just come out of, come out of the closet. I, I have, I'm coming to terms with the Constitution before, and I've, I've realized that um, if we're to avoid what for the Scottish people would be the ultimate nightmare of impoverished independence, that I will have to embrace constitutional reform. Even as an, even as an American civilian. <laughs> Civic and ethnic nationalism is uh, uh, in 
some extent artificial because uh, the lack of the uh, ethnic nationalism doesn't preserve any state from the dictatorship. And we uh, have a lot of examples uh, of the uh, 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 model dictatorship in, in the Latin America. So uh, I would like to remember the ideas uh, which were presented almost 20 years ago by Michael Mann, uh, who believed uh, that it's uh, too early to make a grave for nation state uh, because, first of all, uh, the case of the European Union is absolutely unique, and the future of the European Union is absolutely and from this point of view, there would be uh, a UK referendum on the future of the membership in the European Union is very important for us because it, uh, it, if it will be, it will be proved that the European Union is not the road for all human kind. And as for Scottish aspiration, for independence, uh, me as a representative of the laws of intellectuals, I would like uh, to wish you uh, new orders and those orders who got the victory uh, near the steering. So I wish you independence in the future. Thank you.
in other words, you could not have put a Union flag in your window in the summer of 
big one from the community, a little bit smaller one from the canton, and the small Swiss cross. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'm not that optimistic about uh, the um, the peacefulness of uh, political discussions about questions of nationality. I think the borderline between civic, civilized discussion and violence is very, very close. A, a Belgian example, uh, the foundation of Louvain la Neuf, uh, the, the uh, French-speaking uh, university, uh, was in the 1960s. do that. 
Johnson, for example, as a historian, said uh, it may be that you know the social democratic period in the whole of Western Europe, including Britain, after the war, is one of the great achievements of the human race. Uh, I think the SNP, which I do not belong to, uh, is attempting, I hope successfully, may not be successful, to preserve in this country.
remains and trusts the Labour Party within the Union to deliver uh, that British Social Democratic welfare state. And another sizable chunk has decided that the only way to secure that is to go with the nationalists. But they're not nationalists. Um, but remember, it's still a majority that favours the Union. And even in the recent elections, despite the clean sweep by the it's still, it's still there, it, we're a massively divided society. Though, again, I would repeat this, there's only a debate going on on one side. One side, but when it came to, things changed in September the 18th, when the no voters got their no vote, they turned over in bed and went back to sleep. Right? I, woke, I woke about three or four in the morning of the, of the 90s yeah. to do what gentlemen do in the middle of the night. Right. And, and I, I knew we had won because I could hear nothing, there were no fireworks, and I thought, well, one or two people might be having a nice cup of quiet tea. Other people have just rolled over in bed, thank goodness that's all gone away. If the other side had won, there would have been fireworks, there would have been part. And of course, what happened was the defeated continued with their enthusiasm, they were mobilized, they continued to fight their campaign. The no side, not having any set of values, just wanting this all to go away, just, well, stopped. They just stopped and allowed the other side to make all the running. And that, that's why we're dealing with this very odd situation with the majority. Um, I think there is a bit of peer pressure that prevents people but it's also the case that there's no discourse or even a will to articulate a discourse on the other side. Not the conviction. I'm not the conviction. That's not very good. I'm going to that one. Yeah, Take off the I'm going to put that one. That's superb. Yeah, what would have happened, happened when the majority would have been as loud as the minority was? And we would have a case of political hooliganism. Well, and that's particularly. I mean, one thing, uh, uh, we talk about uh, ethnic, civic, nationalism, I suppose, just to clear that up, from my point of view, all nationalism are on some continuum like that. You know? um, there is no nationalism which doesn't have a component of ethnic and a component <laughs> of civic. You know, it's, uh, everything depends on the proportion. Of course, God is nationalism as an ethnic. There is an enormous amount of people attempting to be as boring as they possibly can, you know, but inside here is something going plump, you know, and uh, something in the throat choking, and they are determined to keep that under control and to hide it. So, you know, it is there, it is there. Uh, I don't know if you'd agree, Colin, but I've always felt that fundamental constitutional awareness in Scottish people, uh, if that's the right term, is a kind of half hidden but always present little cell which uh, says once we were an independent nation, we ruled ourselves. And that conscious of what's having been independent doesn't mean that people want necessarily to be independent again, but it's the awareness that once we were, which is the 
very well be London, which is part of the problem, I guess, and subconsciously that's the way it's, it's perceived, is whether, whether whoever is in charge of the parliamentary dictatorship decides they can agree to it. But if, if, you can't, if you can't get the, what, 40 odd million English to agree to a different, a way to devolve power in a way that is, is acceptable to Scots or the Irish, whatever, then, then that's, that's the hurdle you need to clear. Um, just a question to, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, but just a question on, on, on the welfare state issue. I mean, I, 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 I take that point and I, I get it. I, mean, I perceive that from without a long distance. But what I don't, I don't gather from a distance, maybe this is going on, are people talking about the nuts and bolts of how you would have an independent Scotland would afford to keep it? Because that's, that's the question. It's great to have the aspiration to keep a welfare state. Uh, and, and this is something that all of Western Europe is fighting against because the numbers aren't adding up anymore. Uh, but how do you how do you manage that, and and who pays, and are they willing to pay the price? I can I'll answer for him. That's that's a, who, who should be adding on the same side? No, okay, okay. So first, well, I, I I think I think that essentially is is what the what the unionist company is is doing. It, essentially, it's not it's not projecting an identity. Thank you. 
British National Party got about 1,000 and something votes across the country. The last time, they were getting over 100,000 votes. So if anything positive has come from the discussion about identity, it's the destruction of that particular kind of British fascism, that really rabid British fascism. And instead, perhaps people are starting to embrace this more benign London sense of that you describe. We don't have to have an ideology. We just live together, and it works quite much of the time. Well, and in fact, our main problems are issues of inequality that are across these islands, and not just concentrated in One thing we haven't talked about at all is uh, victimology, which is a component of so many nationalism.
this.